Blood. If blood is centrifuged, its components separate by mass. Plasma makes up 55% of all the blood. White blood cells are leukocytes and platelets make up less than 1% of all the blood. And the other 45% is made up of red blood cells. 90% of plasma is water. This is where many chemical reactions take place. It helps maintain blood volume and therefore blood pressure and it absorbs and carries heat. 8% of plasma is plasma proteins. They function as transport shuttles. Some combine with hormones, vitamins and fatty acids to transport them. They maintain blood volume and osmotic pressure and act as buffers. Three types are albumin, globulins and fibrinogen. There's also a small amount, 1%, in organic salts and they help maintain osmotic pressure. They include sodium, chloride, iron, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, sulfate and potassium. There are trace amounts of nutrients in transit to body cells to be used for cellular respiration or to the liver for processing. There's a trace amount of lipids in the plasma. There's three types. Colloidal fats, which are basically almost undigested fats in transit on their way to be stored. There are phospholipids for fat metabolism and cell membrane building. And there's cholesterol for building steroid hormones and there are also cholesterol deposits in the bloodstream which isn't that great. There are dissolved gases, just a trace amount, oxygen and carbon dioxide, and nitrogenous wastes that include urea, uric acid and creatine that are on their way to the kidneys to be excreted. Red blood cells are also known as erythrocytes. They transport oxygen on their surface. Four oxygen molecules combine with hemoglobin at the iron-based heme group. Hemoglobin can transport oxygen or carbon dioxide. When it's transporting oxygen, it's called oxyhemoglobin. And when it transports carbon dioxide, it's carbaminohemoglobin. Both molecules form weak bonds with hemoglobin. And this is important because carbon dioxide and oxygen have to be allowed to diffuse into the lung alveoli and the body tissues respectively. And if they formed strong bonds with hemoglobin, this wouldn't happen. A molecule that does form a strong bond with hemoglobin is carbon monoxide. And when it forms the bond with hemoglobin, it doesn't let go easily. And this is a problem because these spaces on the hemoglobin that are meant for oxygen and carbon dioxide are occupied by carbon monoxide. And so our oxygen carrying capability would be severely reduced if we had carbon monoxide poisoning and this is why it's so dangerous. Uh, when carbon monoxide combines with hemoglobin it's called carboxyhemoglobin. So that's often confused with carbaminohemoglobin which is good. Carbon dioxide combining with hemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin is bad. Carbon monoxide combining with hemoglobin. In the air sacs of the lungs, oxygen concentration is high. As a result, it diffuses into the blood and bonds with hemoglobin, resulting in oxyhemoglobin. Blood entering the lung tissue is high in carbon dioxide. The bond between hemoglobin and carbon dioxide is broken and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood and into the air sacs. At the body tissues, the reverse happens. Because of cellular respiration, the byproduct carbon dioxide is always in high concentration in the body cells. It therefore diffuses easily into the blood. The incoming blood is high in oxygen, having just been at the lungs. The oxygen diffuses into the tissues and is used for cellular respiration. All blood cells come from the same stem cells and are made in the bone marrow. Red blood cells mature by the process of erythropoiesis, which is stimulated by the hormone erythropoietin. Red blood cells have a lifespan of about three months and new ones are constantly being produced. When we experience chronic lower oxygen levels, as when living at higher altitudes where there is less oxygen, extra erythropoietin is secreted to stimulate the production of more red blood cells. For this reason, endurance athletes often train at higher altitude. This can give them an advantage over athletes who have not trained at altitude since their bodies will have made more red blood cells and they will have a higher oxygen carrying capacity. White blood cells or leukocytes. White blood cells are part of the immune system. They defend the body against pathogens and foreign materials. Some use phagocytosis to engulf invaders. There are five types of leukocytes all produced from stem cells in the bone marrow. 
They live for about three or four days in the average human body. Leukocytes are found throughout the body, including the blood and lymphatic system. White blood cells are specialized. In a healthy person, different types of blood cells fall into normal ranges. A blood test can in indicate what type of infection a person might be fighting based on the number of each type of blood cell. So for example, neutrophils help fight invading bacteria. This image shows an extreme example of invading bacteria where there's a severe infection and the person has developed gangrene, neutrophils at work. If there's a chronic infection such as tuberculosis, monocytes are on the job fighting and you'd expect a higher number of them in the bloodstream. When someone has an allergic reaction to a bee sting for example, eosinophils indicate this reaction. And if someone has a bad cold or a flu, lymphocytes are in high numbers because they produce antibodies to help fight the flu. So if your doctor sends you to the clinic to get a blood test, the results they're going to get back will probably tell them quite a bit about what's happening with your immune system, simply based on the number of each type of white blood cell present. The third type of blood cell we'll look at is platelets. In a way, platelets are like water balloons, filled with fluid and material just waiting to burst. Platelets carry clotting factors and they circulate in the blood. When clotting factors from the platelets are released into the plasma, these factors react with other materials in the plasma forming fibrin, a protein that actually blocks up or wound. Here's how it works. If a blood vessel is broken by a cut or some other type of wound, and we would be talking now at the capillary level or slightly larger blood vessels, passing platelets come past the jagged parts of the wound and are ripped open, releasing thromboplastin. The thromboplastin gets released into the bloodstream and reacts with prothrombin that's already present in the bloodstream. For this reaction to take place, calcium needs to be present. The result is a new product called thrombin. The thrombin reacts with another protein in the plasma, fibrinogen, and what gets produced is some long skinny fibers called fibrin. And those fibers float through the blood but form a clot almost like a log jam where the opening is and this prevents further blood loss. Sometimes blood clotting occurs when platelets pass by deposits in the blood that rip them open and as a result a blood clot forms in the bloodstream and it can stay where it's formed or it can travel to another site. This is a fairly serious medical condition because the blood clot can lodge in major blood vessels and block off the flow of oxygen to tissues. Probably the best known types of clots that cause severe medical problems are pulmonary embolisms which block blood flow through the lungs and embolisms in the brain which cause strokes and prevent blood flow to and through the brain. In general though, platelets function to help us clot our blood whenever a wound is produced and they do this through a series of chemical reactions that are initiated when thromboplastin is released from the platelets as they pass across a wound and are ripped open. 